Hello students, I'm Jan and today we're going to continue on our fundamentals series with Linux process runtime. So previously we uh, looked at how a program bin cat but really our custom uh, version of cat that you know we wrote for simplicity um, gets loaded goes from being a program on the uh, like an elf binary on disk to being a um, program in the um, virtual memory space of a process. All right, let's talk about the next steps. So after it's loaded, initialized, etc., execution begins. Um, how is ex how is that handled? How does execution begin? Well, it is handled using a function called libc start main. It's a library function that your binary will call and expect that to call your main function. It's a bit of a convoluted process um, for a number of reasons. This is the way it is, uh, but let's take a quick look so I can, I can show it to you and then we will move on. Oops, I still had this open from a previous demo. So, all right, um, let's look at our cat program real quick. Nice and simple, just has a main function that cats out either file or standard in depending on whether arguments were given to it or not. Of course, if you recall right here, uh, this is a check if any arguments were given, there'll always be argv zero. I mean, normally you can, of course, launch a process with a completely empty argv. By default, your shell will put argv zero as the name of the process uh, or the, the, yeah, or the name of whatever command was invoked to end up running that program. Um, otherwise, if argc is you know two or more, it'll, that means there is an argv1, a second argument in that array, and it'll be able to open a file um, for reading. All right, let's roll. Um, when I execute cat, as I just did up here, obviously, uh, it cats out the file, but how does that execution actually happen? Um, I created a little uh, tiny library that will be able to LD preload to um, grab a hold of uh, libc start main. Actually, before we do that, let me show you if we do read elf on the cat binary. Uh, and you look right here, this 10c0 is the entry point address of, of the program. Right, so this is where the loader will redirect execution wherever it loaded plus one OC zero um, after it is done loading libraries and everything um, that CAD depends on. Um, let's take a look what is there at that location. So we uh, obj dump um, use obj dump to disassemble CAD, and every time I forget to do it in the right uh, assembly syntax, remember. When on x86, use Intel assembly because AT and T assembly just looks weird. All right, here it is. We have our start right there, and um, wait a second, my mouse cursor just went crazy. Let me let me. Okay, we have start right here at 10 uh, C0. And then we have, um, after a bunch of setup, we see an assembly call into libc start main, and then libc start main takes over execution. Let's take a look at um, uh, compile. So I mentioned we have our, our little, that's from a different thing. Sorry, it's been a long day. Uh, start main dot C. Take a look at this. I wrote this guy to uh, showcase uh, that we can LD preload LD start main just like we can any other library. So we can, of course, compile this. Boom. Now we can LD preload start main dot SO. When we do cat and boom, 
it just types hello if you look at again at uh, uh, if we look at what we wrote it uh, overrides LD, uh, libc start main this is the arguments that libc start main takes it's some crazy stuff it takes uh, a function pointer to main uh, you should get very familiar with this function pointer syntax in C this is a argument called main which is actually a function which takes three arguments int arc C char star star arc V and char star star and P um, and we'll talk about NP in a sec and it takes an argument to uh, the actual arc C the actual arc V uh, a bunch of function pointers to initializers um, uh, constructors de destructors and so forth and a pointer to where the stack ends um, I have no idea how it gets the environment variable pointer I didn't look into it so I just passed that zero but then we just call main very cool um, so when the LD preload all it does prints hello then exits with the return code and it works very cool stuff all right so we can override even this sort of base functionality all right let's move on um what is next so um cat after uh, after it gets launched it reads its arguments and environment from um memory right we have these two uh, arguments arg v and, and np let's uh look at what that uh entails right again the only input from the outside world at program start are these arguments right everything else is just you know binaries loaded in in, in uh, memory um what is actually an environment variable uh let's take a look an environment variable is something like this ld preload thing it is an little. It is an argument, essentially an extra argument that you can pass in uh, other outside of the argv uh, set of strings to your program. There's a lot of environment variables. You can hit env to list out all the environment variables set for you at that time. There's a lot of them here. Um, if you uh, want of course you can access them programmatically I wrote a little uh, and uh, an actual system utility I also wrote a little replacement for it for us to play with you get this NP and you can just iterate through and print out um, every entry of NP until you hit a null pointer that terminates the, the NP um, array so let's uh, compile this Okay, and run it. Boom, nice and simple. All right, we can also pass it uh, some environment variable. And here it is, it shows up in our NP. I can also, so this lets me just, oops. This lets me just send it tons of uh, environment variable or add tons of variables to its environment separated by spaces if you want spaces in your environment variables um, you can do this nice and simple okay um, environment variables are a good way to uh, pass arguments to for example um, uh, little LD preload libraries you you, you design to to debug things uh, because it's a pain in the butt to grab the um, actual uh, command line arguments at that point um, they also change the behavior of uh, some normal utilities that you might be used to so I created this test folder inside this test folder there are five files a file called one lowercase a uppercase a lowercase b uppercase b do an ls dash l it sorts the files by name right and here we have something that looks reasonable one lowercase a uppercase a lowercase b uppercase b but the interesting thing is in ascii the uppercase letters should go before the lowercase letters a uppercase is ox41 and b uppercase is ox42 
A lowercase is 61 and B is 62. So they should be very differently configured. It turns out that um, this lang environment variable that's set by default is responsible. This tells libc, uh, probably libc, either libc or ls, to sort these uh, variable or these uh, file names differently. If we set the lang to capital C, there's the see the language. Um, this is the default, like ASCII normal way of sorting it. Um, then we can do ls-l and see the correct sorting, so to say. Um, just as an example that these variables have on impact. All right, we have talked about variables. Let's move on. So uh, cat gets its variables from the environment. Everything is all super um, happy. Of course, it needs to keep interacting with the outside world. It's not just like a one way, you know, we just give it a bunch of arguments and, and does a thing. It needs to be able to open files, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so how does it do that? How do programs, uh, you know, actually achieve their functionality when that functionality can be pretty complex? Um, well, one kind of way paradigm speaking in terms of like paradigms is using library function, right? You should actually in your entire life strive to write as, as little code as possible, few lines of code as you possibly can. And you do that by using library functionality. Be smart about it and use libraries. Um, libraries, we had to go through a whole crazy thing to even find where the libraries are, as we talked about in the last lecture. Um, now we need to go through a, a further thing to understand where in the library certain symbols or certain functions are that we're using, right? These are called symbols, um, as in like names of, of the binary. So let's take a quick look. Um, I'm going to mention, I'm mostly talking about this kind of in a historical context. This used to be a massive surface of uh, like uh, a massive attack surface because you used to be able to really mess with the loading process. Uh, recently, this is not really the case anymore. Uh, it used to be that all of these symbols would be resolved on demand. So if your program used printf, Printf wouldn't actually be located inside libc until you went and called printf. This is because of a complex program that used maybe thousands and thousands of symbols and was loaded on a slow computer would actually take a while to look all of these up. And you don't want to pay that cost until you actually use that functionality. Um, nowadays, our computers are blazing fast and this uh, on-demand lookup caused so many security uh, problems and, and, and exposed so many security holes that we no longer normally do that. Uh, nowadays, uh, things mostly get resolved at low time and um, protected. So we'll actually revisit this in the memory corruption section from a historical perspective. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to show you what symbols look like in uh, a binary and then we'll move on. Um, all right, so we, we have our uh, cat. Um, let's look at the symbols that cat uh, imports. So these are all of the various library um, um, uh, functions that cat will use or not just functions, it can also be globals exported by the library. Um, so we know libc start main, of course we use open, read and write. This is a security feature we'll talk about um, in the memory corruption module uh, that basically uh, protects against certain exploitation types. These are various other, uh, sorry, that these are various other um, functionality set up and, and, and tear down. Um, and these are all the symbols that cat uh, imports. The symbols that cat exports are um, underscore start. That's where our entry point is. Uh, let's see if we can find main. Here's main. Pretty cool stuff. We can also look at our um, start main library. That's more interesting. It actually exports libc start main. Where is that?
There it is. It exports libc start main, whereas if we look at cat again, just to just, uh, import, it'll import libc start main. I'm using nm. It's a utility to look at symbols and binaries. Um, roughly speaking, these symbols that are u that are not defined in the binary will be imported from somewhere else. Symbols that are defined in the binary that have an address will be potentially exported somewhere else. In fact, nowadays, if we look at, at CAD using file, as I mentioned earlier in, uh, in, in, in a previous lecture, nowadays, um, all these uh, dynamically linked binaries, they're actually uh, libraries of their own. So, so another, I could LD preload cat in, that'll probably cause some chaos because uh, there'd be two main functions, but you know, theoretically you could load cat as a library. All right, um, that's neither here nor there. Let's get back to work. So now we've looked at um, library functions. So that's one way of interacting with the environment. What is another way? How else might we do it? Well, we do it using system calls. We already mentioned two previously in the process loading, fork and clone, and actually a third, exec. So these are all system calls. This is how you interact with Linux as an operating system with the, world like all uh, external interaction is going to be um, at least going to be initiated through system calls uh, we can use s trace which we already uh, kind of had a sneak peek in the loading to look at these system calls as they execute so let's check it out let's say s trace cat cat.c so you can see exactly what happens starting from the exec and going onwards into various setup uh, procedures, you know, mapping in uh, space for libraries and so forth, um, all the way through opening the file we want to cat out, reading that file. So this is what is read, read 170 bytes. And if we actually use uh, check how big that file is. It is exactly 170 bytes and then writing it out. So here we do the write and uh, with a 170 and, and of course the this is the S trace prints out the system calls to standard error while the binary is printing stuff to standard out it goes to the same terminal. So we can oops wrong one. We can redirect the output and now this looks a little cleaner or we can redirect standard error and just see the original output. All right, so we do the read, we do the write, we do another read and we get zero and then we exit. If we uh, look at cat.c, that, that makes exact sense. So here's the while loop. It says while we read, our read returns greater than zero and the write returns greater than zero, keep looping. In this case, the read returned zero and we terminated. And there you go. That is a uh, system calls. One more thing, you can do man syscalls. This will give you a whole lot of documentation about how system calls work. This is how uh, their, their calling convention on different architectures. Um, it's very cool stuff. You can also look at a specific system call. This is open, for example. Within, with its documentation. Um, if you, you'll notice uh, that I don't include stuff and this leads to warnings everywhere. I'm very lazy, but you the man page will tell me what to include so that the warnings go away, which would be awesome, but I'm not gonna do it. All right, cool. Uh, one more thing. These system calls that you use in C, they're actually C functions that get called. So if we disassemble, disassemble cat and we look at main, it's calling open inside libc. Um, it's very hard without writing custom assembly to actually get libc to, to uh, or to get GCC to emit code that uh, triggers a syscall. Um, libc has wrappers for it that will trigger the correct system call 
if you don't want to use libc if you want to write code that doesn't use libc when you're writing shell code in your next assignment or in your next in one of your assignments in the shell coding module you will need to handcraft those system calls um one awesome resource for system calls is uh how can i show this easily i i'll post it in uh in the module instead all right um cool so uh you can also do a syscall call which allows you to specify the system call number each system call has a number so as we uh s trace this um what we would actually see because hmm, s trace is too friendly uh every system call has a number and what happens to trigger a system call we'll talk about this actually more in the shell coding module is you pass that number and you uh, trigger a system call um, to show you. Let me look up the syscall numbers. All right. For example, read is system call zero. So we can actually modify cat.c. Instead of read, we do syscall zero with the arguments okay compile cat.c and cat 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 .c. do the s trace and it looks exactly the same read right right is this call one so we can do this here this gets us one step closer um to what things would look like um, if you were writing, you know, syscalls manually in assembly and shellcode. And we'll take the final st step there um, a little later. Let me, um, how would I show you? So where I get the syscall numbers, oh, you can see it here on the side, uh, but it is actually optimized for the slides. So you can't really see it. This is a Linux syscall table um created by ryan a chapman he is a uh, hero of uh shell coders everywhere you can just google ryan a chapman uh x86 syscall table very useful all right back to slides let's roll on um so that's how syscalls work is that the only way to interact with environments i mean using syscalls we can do many 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 things we can uh um, uh, open, read, write, as we saw, fork, exec. Uh, we can use wait to wait for a child process to terminate. We actually have to use it to avoid zombie processes that I'll talk about in a sec. Um, we can invoke arbitrary syscalls. There, there are syscalls to, uh, you know, attach to process as a debugger. There are syscalls to uh, open network connections. There are syscalls for, for quite a lot of uh, various things. Uh, you can, again, look at man syscalls for a, uh, more information. Um, very uh, standard interface for you know, doing operating system stuff. Generally speaking, it, to do anything you, uh, in Linux, you have to open some sort of a resource and then interact with it using read and write sometimes other syscalls other times so we'll explore this even further in the kernel module all right syscalls are a way to call into the os but the os can't invoke a syscall into your um process when when something you know happens how can the os talk to you or someone externally talk to you and kind of to get your attention um, of course, you can use syscalls to like read from a pipe constantly and check, but or read from a file. But another way is to use signals. A signal is a signal, basically, hey, that the OS sends to your process. There's a bunch of different signals um, that you can define signal handlers for, and you can send to other processes or yourself. 
if you don't have a signal handler for a signal and you receive one of these signals, uh, the default action will be taken. For some signals, the default action is ignore. For others, it is uh, die. Your process will die. Um, there are two signals that cannot be caught. One is sig kill. So if you've ever killed dash nine, something in Linux, that is what you're doing. You're sending it a uh, signal nine and sig stop signal 19. It'll background a process um, in Linux. Uh, interestingly, there are two variants of sig stop signal 19 and signal 20. When you hit control Z in your shell, it sends signal 20, which you can catch, which is really annoying. Signal 19, you have to send manually. All right. This is kind of uh, the common signals that you'll see. Um, sig int is what is uh, sent when you hit control C. Um, and I think sig quit for many terminals is control backslash, uh, various other ones. Um, you, you can have a signal if, you know, one of your uh, children processes has stopped. Um, with your terminal window is resized, it's not listed here, but that sends a signal to the shell. Um, all sorts of uh, cool stuff. Anyways, let's take a quick look at signals. Um, so I wrote a crazy thing that catches all signals, right? So the loops through all of the signals uh, and it uh, registers a signal handler using this signal function. And uh, the signal handler just only prints out that it received the signal and does nothing. And then this thing sits there and loops forever. It's a very frustrating program. Whoops. Because it's very hard to kill. If I hit control C, it says got signal two. We we'll take look later, but if you do kill dash L, it'll tell you signal two is uh, um, uh, sig end. Control Z, there's signal 20, uh, sig terminal stop. Um, it's just hard to kill this program. In another terminal right now, I'm gonna do this, kill dash nine. Actually, let's do dash 19 first, sig stop, and then uh, this guy, pgrep signal. So the, uh, so I'm gonna copy that, paste it into another terminal. Boom. So now we have uh, stopped this uh, binary in bash, you can of course hit bg. This lists, <laughs> this lists the background signals. What is signal 18 that it got? Oh, bg, oh, sorry. Jobs is how you list the jobs that are currently uh, around. Um, BG is to send a job into a, a into background and resume its ru uh, running. Resume running a process in the background. Jobs is what Bash calls these background processes. Um, if you do kill that shell, let's take a look. I bet 18 is sig cont. Yep. So 18 says, hey, you're now continuing. So you it triggers the, the handler and then resumes execution. Um, so it's running in the background. You can hit FG to bring it back to the foreground. And now, of course, we're stuck with the same problem. I'm going to send this uh, kill 19 again. Jobs. Now it's stopped in the background. Um, let's see. In the foreground, will it get the window? Yeah. See, signal 28. Okay, but now I need to fix my stream. Okay. Awesome. Got signal 28 many times. If we stop it again in a different terminal. Signal 28 is sig winch, window changed. So there's a lot of cool signals. Um, there are signals that, that happen when uh, a file descriptor you're writing to has stopped working. There are like connection dropped or whatever. When your program seg faults, that's a signal. So this, uh, this program that catches everything is unseg faultable. Anyways, that's uh, fun and, and all, but let's uh, let's kill it. We can't do that. So what I'm gonna do is kill dash nine, pgrep signal. That's the name of the binary. All pgrep does, actually, let me pause it again. pgrep just uh, tells you it's um, process ID. It's the same as, oops, roughly the same as doing this. Oh, that's my system upgrading in the background. And then here's our signal guy. All right, so it is stopped in the background. If we foreground it, now I'm gonna do kill dash nine, boom, killed. 
that no way to catch kill dash nine or kill dash 19. That is signals, very cool stuff. Using signals, you can uh, it, it, do some cool stuff. You can, you can, for example, one more thing. I'm gonna write you a program real quick. I'll be right back. All right, I am back. Let's take a look at this program I wrote for you. This is a useful signal. Alarm, signal 14. So if you do kill dash L, here it is. Beautiful sig alarm. Of course, if I had included kill.c, I could actually use this macro, but we're um, gonna rough it out, tough it out, and uh, use the actual signal number. All right, so that you can remember it. Signal 14 is alarm. There's a, a function called alarm. Oh, it sets an alarm clock delivery for a signal. So it tells the kernel, hey, it's a syscall. It tells the kernel, hey, wait, or uh, give me signal 14 in three seconds in this case, however many, however long. Um, looks like it only supports seconds. Probably there's a way, a sub separate syscall to support nanoseconds or whatever. Um, by default, receiving signal 14 will kill your process. It'll actually print alarm clock and kill your process. We're gonna change it. We're gonna catch it here and print ding and then exit. You can do anything. You don't have to exit. It's a, it's a great um, thing. An interesting thing I'll show you in a sec is that receiving a signal um, <clears throat> breaks your uh, program out of certain um, block situations like uh, long sleep. So uh, we compile. We run, it's gonna wait three seconds in this infinite loop. Let's, uh, gonna wait three seconds in this uh, this infinite loop and then it'll alar uh, the alarm will trigger. It'll hit this signal handler right here, printing and exit. All right, awesome. Run, two, one, ding, boom. Awesome, so let me show you another cool thing here. If we uh, don't exit, of course, this will keep running. It'll just keep looping. Let me just show you that. One, two, three, keeps running. This is a silly way to uh, run forever because it, it puts a lot of strain on your CPU. It's just running constantly. Instead, you can sleep for a very long time this is uh, 100,000 seconds. But, oops. One, two, three, boom, it terminated. There are certain system calls that are interruptible by signals. I think in a similar way, so if we do read from standard in, And don't give it anything I think we should also be able to interrupt that let's test I was wrong so read doesn't get interrupted by an alarm all right point is uh, but there are other ways to make read timeout but that's going off on way too deep a tangent let me just undo that so we have our old alarm binary uh, file cool that's uh, signals we're now going to move on um, another way of interacting with the outside world is shared memory. There are various ways to uh, establish shared memory with another process. Um, the easiest one, uh, there are ways to do it through the clone syscall. One way that you cannot do it is with fork. Fork, very in, uh, interestingly, actually splits, uh, makes the memory regions copy and write. Whenever a process tries to write to it, it'll actually just copy it and write to its own private version. Um, but there are other ways. There's a file system that exists in uh, dev shm. Let me show it to you. Um, this file system is used for a bunch of stuff. Well, not on my machine, but it's basically a memory mapped, memory mapped file system. You can create files here um, and map these files using mmap. You can map a file by its file descriptor. Um, 
from multiple processes and access it at the same time and use this as an easy way to set up mapped memory. Very cool. All right, uh, set up shared memory. Super simple. Um, and it's a way to communicate with the outside world or with other things using that shared memory. All right, we've come to the end. What happens now? Cat terminates. Termination is surprisingly non, not so trivial, right? Um, termination in a process can handle one or two ways. Receiving an unhandled uh, signal or calling the exit system call. Uh, those are the only two ways that a process can terminate. You might say, oh, but what about a segmentation fault if, if my process just crashes? Guess what? Seg fault is a signal. When your process crashes, what actually happens is it receives a signal, SIG 10, uh, signal 10, and, well, let me now, for some reason, I just had a moment of doubt, kill that shell. No, of course not signal, signal 11, what am I saying? It's been a long day. It receives a signal 11, a sec fault, and um, crashes. And not doesn't crash. It receives a signal 11 and terminates because it doesn't handle it. You can install a handler for signal 11 uh, and survive sec faults. You can even try to fix things up and keep going, but that's generally a bad idea. Um, you can also send a signal 11 to other processes that didn't crash that you can, you know, send kill uh, signals to and, and make them sec fault without uh, them doing anything wrong necessarily. But anyways, these are the only two ways to go um, in Linux. After you go, after you exit um, or you, you uh, get killed, um, your process must be reaped. So after a process terminates, it'll remain in a zombie state until its parent waits on it. If you don't wait on your processes and on your children processes and you die, they will be reparented and will remain zombies. This used to be a big problem because um, until very recently, Linux only had 16 bit, uh, a 16 bit integer for um, its process ID. So you could actually run out of processes. Now it's a 32 bit integer and uh, it's much harder to run out of processes. Um, but still not good, you do PSAUX and you see a ton of zombies, they're the ones in parentheses, not fun. Uh, so uh, reap your processes, use the wait system call to collect their status. All right, um, and that is it. We have gone through the entire life cycle of a Linux process, it has taken me Dozens of takes. I kept screwing up in the first couple of slides uh, and then kept restarting. It's been hours. I am thirsty and hungry. Super tired. Thank you for uh, sticking with it. Um, I will see you in future lectures. Goodbye.